give you an overview of uh, atmospheric turbulence and what it does to our telescope and, and how we can get around it with the uh, optics. So after all the upbeat talks before, there's going to be more of a downer. We get down to reality and see what happens. So our telescope is ground-based, so it's going to be on the ground looking up through the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere uh, behaves in a turbulent fashion. Uh, after the light comes from the sun for millions and millions of kilometers, completely undisturbed, finally hits the atmosphere and is distorted by the atmospheric turbulence. So the atmospheric turbulence mixes air with different temperatures, and therefore different uh, densities and different index of variation, uh, index of refraction. So these variations in index of refraction will uh, distort our wavefronts. And uh, when we image with these wavefronts, we'll, we'll produce distorted images with our telescope. So how does the, the turbulence work? Uh, Energy is in, inserted into the turbulence in big scales, so you have <coughs> big bubbles, big uh, pockets of, of air with uh, different temperatures, and they start mixing in a turbulent fashion. Uh, these pockets break down into smaller sizes, and uh, they end up in a, with, a, with a size distribution that follows a power law. So this allows us to pretty much characterize the, the turbulence with a single parameter, which is basically the strength of this power law. And this parameter is called the Fried parameter, and it's usually written with R0. And it's got units of length. Uh, you can visualize it as a, the size, the diameter of a circle that has a, a one radiant wavefront RMS error. So reasonable values for this R0 parameter, uh, average scene will, will give you, will have an R0 parameter value of 10 centimeters. Uh, pretty good seeing will, will be double that, 20 centimeters. Anything below 10 will, will consider bad seeing. Now, how, do, how does this, uh, so you can, you can see here we have a, a, an example of uh, the phase distortion that turbulence will introduce, and you can see that the all uh, uh, scales are, are represented. It's a bit like a fractal in, in a way. You have big spaces, uh, big scales and small scales distributed according to this power law. Now, once we, we have these wavefront distortions and we put them into our telescope, they're going to produce image distortions. And the severity of these distortions uh, is proportional to d over R0, to the ratio between the, the aperture, the diameter aperture of our telescope, and the R0 parameter that characterizes the atmosphere. So if you have an, a, a telescope that is about the same size as R0, you're going to have a one radian wavefront sensor, uh, one radian wavefront RMS error in your, in your wavefront. And that's going to be OK. You're not going to see much. But the moment that your, your aperture is bigger than R0, you're going to start seeing uh, these distortions have an effect in your image quality. Now, for example, with your eye, uh, the, the aperture of your eye is one centimeter. So normally, you wouldn't see any of these effects when you look at things with your eyes. But when you look at with a, with a bigger telescope, you, you're going to start seeing these effects. Now, turbulence is also really fast. And it changes in scales of milliseconds. So if we want to be able to compensate it and do something about it, we need some systems that will react to it and, and can operate really fast. Uh, this is a, a plot that, to confuse things, plots the inverse of R0. Uh, basically, uh, so before, uh, I, I told you that big R0 is good. Large, uh, larger zeros will give you less distortions. So here is the opposite. Slow uh, value on this plot is good, and large value is bad. So this is a plot taken from New Mexico, from our telescope in New Mexico, the Dan Solar Telescope, the DST. And it illustrates the fact that uh, the best scene occurs early in the morning. So the sun comes up here, and uh, the, the scene conditions improve. They hit a, an optimal value, and then immediately they start going horrible. And you can also see how there's a lot of variation throughout the day. Sometimes you get good scene, sometimes you get bad scene, and it can change really fast. Uh, I think, yeah, these are two different samples for good scene and not so good scene. So here, the scene never got good, not even in the morning. So to, talk, uh, to quantify what the, the, these distortions, uh, these uh, atmospheric distortions do to our images, we're going to use an optical quantity called the point spec function, which is basically the image uh, that your optical system makes of a point. So an optical system, an ideal optical system, will, will map uh, an object to an image. And it will map every single point in the object to every single point in the image, one to one. Now, in reality, an, uh, an ideal system doesn't exist. So you are limited by diffraction. So the image of a point in your object is going to be a certain diffraction pattern in your image. And this is, for example, here illustrated. You have uh, the airy <coughs> disk 
which uh, here in this plot you can see it's a central, narrow, tall uh, peak surrounded by some diffraction rings. Uh, this is the, the, the square uh, of the PSF. Uh, it's, just to, it's just done that way to, to enhance the, the details. This thing is dying. All right, well, I killed it. Uh, now, once you have, uh, if you have a diffraction limited system, you, the size of your diffraction pattern, so the, the image of a point, the PSF, the point spread function, is going to have a width of lambda over d, like Valentin was saying in the previous talk. Oh, sure. Oh, and feel free to ask any questions uh, at any time. The bottom one? Thank you. Where was I? So, yeah, so the, the width of our PSF for a perfect diffraction limited system is going to be lambda over d. So it's, uh, the bigger the aperture of your telescope, the narrower this, this PSF is going to be and the higher resolution you're going to have. Once you introduce the, introduce the atmosphere, uh, you're going to get a, a much bigger blob as your PSF. So basically, the image of a point is going to be a big blob. What this is going to do is that uh, it's going to neighboring points in your object are going to be smoothed together in your image, and you're going to get a blurry image. And here, uh, oops, uh, you can see here that, that in the diffraction limit peak, uh, you have all the energy concentrated in a very narrow area. Once you introduce the atmosphere, things smooth out and spread out. And all this energy that was very concentrated now is spread out over a larger area that will give you a, a blurrier image. If we take the Fourier transform of the PSF, of the point spread function, we go into the frequency domain, and we have the, the, what's called the optical transfer function, the OTF. You can think of this as the, the band pass, the, freq the spatial frequency band pass of your optical system. How does your optical system propagate spatial frequencies through it? So the blue line here in the plot is the diffraction limit. So it basically prop uh, allows all the spatial frequencies to pass through your system up to a certain cutoff, which is the inverse of the, the, the width of your PSF the over lambda. And once you introduce the atmosphere, now this reduces the maximum frequency that you can achieve significantly. And, and all these mid-range high spatial frequencies are completely lost. And here on the right, uh, I, I repeat the, the, same, the same plot here, but in a logarithmic scale. So you can see that actually these frequencies are lost. It's not like they're here hidden a little bit. They're just gone. So once the atmosphere distorts your image, you cannot recover all this information. It's lost. So with a perfect uh, in a perfect world where you have a deepest telescope and there's no atmosphere, everything is good, you, you, uh, all the optics are perfect and you achieve diffraction limited performance, this is how an image of the solar granulation will look. This is a 40 by 40 or seconds uh, field of view image. And you can see all the granules and all the intergranular lanes. Now, if, you, you, if we use the, the diffraction, uh, the, resol the full resolution of deepest at four, four kilometers uh, or with four meter aperture, uh, this image is 3,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels. So you're not going to be able to see many of the fine details here in this, in this display. So for that, I, I blew, up the, blew out the central region, 10 by 10 seconds. So you can see all this high, uh, fine detail, little points, and all this, uh, all this uh, higher spatial resolution information that is in the image. So let's put the atmosphere on and see how it looks. So this is a simulated video because right now we don't have a, a four meter solar telescope. We don't know what we're going to find. So we, we got an a, a image, this simulated image of the solar surface provided by Matthias Rempel from HAO. And we distorted according to the atmosphere conditions. And we, we plotted again a 40 by 40 uh, field of view. And uh, so it is, it, this is basically a static image. There's not going to be any solar evolution. And what you're seeing right now is in real time. So I'm showing you six seconds at 30 frames per second. And this is how it would look in the telescope. So let's take a, um, there we go. So let's take a, an exposure, a one second exposure. So basically, let's average a few frames from the previous uh, video. And for comparison, this is the diffraction limited image that I showed you before. And this is what you get when you're seeing limited. So all this high frequency information, all these nice little small details that you had in the, in the diffraction limited image, like these bright points here, these bright points, this little guy here, they're completely gone. Now, the resolution, like I told you before, the, go ahead. 
Uh, so R0, uh, the question was, what is R0? R0 is called the Fried parameter, and it's uh, the parameter that we use to characterize the strength of the atmosphere. So if R0 is big, the scene is good. If R0 is small, the scene is bad. Yes. It, it, it's the diameter, uh, um, yeah, the size of the circle that has a, a, a variance, an RMS error of one radiant. And uh, an RMS radiant, uh, error of one radiant is okay. If you, if you put that through your telescope, you're not gonna see it much. So basically it gives you the size that, that, will, that, that you don't care about. The size that, that if my telescope is this big, I'm good. So what, what we said before is that the size of the diffraction limited is uh, PSF is lambda over D, the width of it. And when you put the atmosphere, the, the, the size of the PSF is lambda over R0. So it, putting the atmosphere in there, it's equivalent to saying that we are imaging this image with a R0 size telescope. Oh, well, before, before I go there, uh, let me again blow up the, the central part of the image so I can show you the small detail and how it's gone. Like I said before, you, all these little details, they're completely washed out. <coughs> so then, uh, putting your four meter telescope through a 10 centimeter R0 atmosphere, it's equivalent to using a 10 centimeter telescope. And to really illustrate this point, I went ahead and distorted that diffraction limited image with a 10 centimeter telescope aperture. So basically, this is the image that you would get with a 10 centimeter telescope without any atmosphere, with perfect conditions. And this is what you get with the thickest four meter telescope with the atmosphere, so they look pretty similar. And it's a lot cheaper to build 10 centimeter telescopes than to build four meter telescopes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Sure, no, no, th th there, are, there are good things about it. So what can we do about it? Not everything is bad. We can use adaptive optics. Uh, an adaptive optics system will correct in real time for these incoming wavefront aberrations that, that were introduced by atmospheric turbulence. Uh, just here, you have a simple diagram of what a, uh, an AO system looks like. Uh, an AO system has two basic components, uh, some active com uh, components that will correct the wavefront, and some sensing components that will measure how well you're doing. And you close the loop between these two, co two components, and you, you try to follow the atmosphere and try to correct for the distortions as they come in. Uh, so here you have the sun, the, the perfect wavefront through space, gets into the atmosphere, gets distorted. Now, enters your telescope and finds your deformable mirror, which is your first active corrected element. The deformable mirror is just a, a, a faceplate mirror with a bunch of actuators that push and pull behind it, and it's able to change its shape to match the incoming uh, shape of the, of the distorted wavefront, and then in that way correct it and make it flat again. Then after this uh, wavefront is corrected by your deformable mirror, uh, most of the light is sent down to the science path for captured data, and a little percentage of a small percentage of the, of the light will be used for wavefront sensing. And here we measure how well we did in the correction and then update the shape of the DM accordingly. Now this has to run really fast because the atmosphere changes really fast in the millisecond range. So uh, solar radio systems routinely run at, at several kilohertz, at two kilohertz. So the thickest AO uh, system that would be available during first light will operate at two kilohertz. So this system has to run pretty fast. Now let's see how do, how do we do wavefront sensing. Uh, for wavefront sensing to measure the shape of the wavefront as it comes in uh, and, and how well to, to measure how well we're correcting, we're going to use a shark harman wavefront sensor, which is basically a, a, a grid of lenslets that sample our pupil in different locations. So each one of these little subapertures is a lens that will generate a, an image of the sun. Um, and uh, so when you, oh, let's look at this little diagram here. When you have a flat wavefront, like the flat line here, each of the lenslets will generate the solar image and they will be identical, they will be perfect, they will be centered. Once you have a distorted wavefront, distorted wavefront, you'll have local tilt at every single of these locations of the subapertures. And this local tilt will, trans will translate into a shifted image at that particular location. So by measuring the local tilt in each one of these subapertures, you can extrapolate the first derivative of the wavefront and that way reconstruct the 2D uh, uh, reconstruction of, of how the wavefront looks. Uh, nighttime people, uh, so uh, AO, AO systems, nighttime, they're, they're, they normally use stars 
for this uh, to detect how the images are shift. So each sub aperture will image uh, the same star, and you'll see how the stars move around, and it's relatively easy for a computer to find out the relative shifts between these points that move around. In the sun, we are actually, uh, with solar AI, uh, adaptive optics, uh, we are looking at, at the solar surface and we're looking at structures like granulation or a, or a sunspot or a pore or whatever structure you, you, you happen to look at. So it's not so easy. It's not, yes? Oh, I Uh, the, so the question is, what is the, the, the finest uh, resolution that you can correct? And the answer is the, is the separation between the lens lens. So the, the diffraction limit of the lens lens will tell you what you can look at. If you're looking at something that uh, is very small and very, has very low contrast, the, the small resolution of these lenses, because they're pretty small, will wash it out, will wash this detail out, and you won't be able to see it move. But uh, the ultimate uh, resolution that you can correct well, this is the resolution you can measure. The resolution you can correct comes from the, the same elements in the end. But yeah, but basically they're matched. So yes, the resolution you can correct is the separation between these lenses. So do, in solar, uh, to, to measure this, uh, uh, these shifts between the solar images that we're imaging in each one of these sub apertures, we're going to use a mathematical tool called a cross correlation. And this is what a cross correlation looks like mathematically. Uh, it's just basically a, a, a measure of similarity between two functions. So it's similar to a convolution, but the, the sign here is switched, if you happen to remember the, the formula for a convolution. Uh, so you can cross-correlate all the superaperture images to a reference, and then you can measure uh, the shift between them. And uh, this operation has the nice property that it simplifies in the Fourier space, in the Fourier domain. So it becomes just a simple product. And we can take advantage of these to optimize our calculations. So let's do an example. Here we have two, two images, two functions. Uh, one is a, a shifted version of the other. So we're going to cross-correlate this object with this reference and see what we get. And we get a cross-correlation peak that is centered on the location where the shifted object was. So for a computer, it's really easy to find out this peak. And it was not so easy to find out where the strawberry is. And just to show you that that is where the, the strawberry happens to be, I overlay the, the image. So uh, applying this to the solar adaptive optics, uh, we have each one of the subapertures is, is imaging uh, a portion of the sun, the same portion of the sun. And each one of these images are slightly shifted with respect to each other. And you, you can agree with me that it's really hard to tell that they are shifted. Now, you calculate the cross correlations between all these subaperture images and a reference one, and you get the cross correlation peaks. And now it's a bit easier to see. For example, you can see that this one and this one are a bit shifted to, to each other. And you can extract the shift of each one of these sub apertures, uh, course correlation peaks, and um, build a first derivative maps so that you can then integrate and build a 2D map of your wavefront. Then you can use this wavefront to update the shape of your performable mirror and to uh, close the loop and improve your correction. Now, I've been showing you all these uh, small number of sub apertures. So to give you a scale of what the dick is, the big step forward that the dick is this. Oh, sorry, a question? So the reference will be, uh, the question was, what is the reference subaperture in, in these calculations? So what you do is when you, when you start your system, you pick one as a reference, and you keep that. And then you cross-correlate everything to that continuously. And then uh, because the sun surface, the solar surface will evolve in this time, you, every so often you have to renew your reference. So you pick another one, and you keep doing this. So here gives you an idea, uh, a visualization of the, the, the scale difference between this is what the previous, uh, previous generation of telescopes look like. This is the meter class, or the, this example in particular is the telescope in New Mexico, the Dan Solar Telescope, point, uh, 76 centimeters. It had a 10 by 10 grid of apertures with a total of 76. And now we're going to a 4 meter telescope with a 43 by 43 uh, grid of apertures with a total of 1457. So we're running at 2 kilohertz. That means that we got to be ready in half a millisecond. And we got to calculate 1457 cross correlations in that time. Well, in less than that time. So uh, we put all together. So how does adaptive optics look? 
Here on the left is the video I showed you before, the scene limited uh, image from Dickist. And here is the AO corrected image that we get once we turn the AO on. Again, these are simulations. We still don't have the telescope. We don't have anything that we can take data with. But this is what we think it's going to look like. Uh, th things to notice right away is that the, the image is much sharper in the, in the center here than this. You, you can see some small detail there. But the, the performance, the, the correction, the, the, the sharpness of the image degrades as you get away from this point. Now let me again blow out the, the central area so you can see more detail. And again, the, the one on the left is the scene limited. The one on the right is the AO corrected image. And the AO correction has managed to recover all this really high spatial frequency information, all this very, very fine detail that were in the, in the original object. Now let's take a, a, an exposure. So instead of having a video, we do an average of several frames and compare it to the diffraction limited images that I showed you before to see how well we're doing. And uh, you can see that again, very, really sharp in the middle, comparable to the diffraction limit, but quickly degrades as you go away. Uh, the reason for this is that the AO system is measuring the, the, the distortions in this direction. And these distortions are not usually correct and valid for any other field point. And we'll talk more about this later. Again, I'll, sh I'll blow up the central region so you can see what happens. Why it's blurry uh, on the edges? I, I think I'll, if, you, if you want, let me, let me wait until later, because later I'll go into more detail about this. It, it become more clear. So the AO system correction, again, this is the, on the left, the diffraction limit, perfect image. On the right, AO corrected image. We see that we were able to recover all this very high detail information. But it's not really quite perfect yet. Now, can we estimate what the resolution that we are looking at uh, after the correction? So, uh, I'll, I'll show you later how the, the resolution that you're seeing here, you, you're achieving here, is exactly the diffraction limited resolution. So, you have achieved uh, uh, what your telescope can offer. The problem is that it's not all what it should be. But you have achieved. Uh, basically the fraction limit. At the same yes, where, where the correction is sharpest. So let's talk about the limitations of adaptive optics. Uh, so the air correction, uh, like I just said, uh, restores the fraction limited resolution. But the correction is only partial. We have a limited number of sensing components and a limited number of active components that will set a maximum, a high limit on how much we can correct. The correction is field dependent. It's sharp in the center, and it gets uh, less sharp as you get away from the, from the center. And this is called anisoplanetism. Uh, because we use a cross-correlating uh, cross wavefront sensor, we are measuring the, 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 local, tilt, the local shift of the superaperture images using cross-correlations. This uh, translates into an averaging over a certain field of view, and we, that makes us lose sensitivity uh, in height. So basically, high layers are not going to be as well sensed as low altitude layers. And again, to compound things, good seeing often happens in the morning. And the telescope is not up yet, so we are not 100% sure this is going to be the case. But uh, site survey results and, and experience tells us that we'll probably be, this will probably be the case. So in the morning, we are looking at low solar elevations. So the, the, the sun is, is low in the sky. And we are looking through a lot of atmosphere. And whatever averaging effects that we were suffering before will be compounded. So let's talk about these uh, limitations one by one. Uh, the air correction is only partial. Uh, and here I showed you the same plot as before. Before we only had the fraction limited plot uh, and the, the, the scene limited line here. Now we have what the AO provides. So basically we have restored, uh, this is the OTF. So this is, remember, is the frequency uh, the, the PSF, the point spread function in the frequency domain, so how your optical system propagates spatial frequencies. So now we have managed to restore all these frequencies that were lost here. This is the logarithmic plug. They were lost before, and now they have been restored. But they are not at the same level as the fraction limit. So that means that your quantitative data you may, you may get from your measurements is going to be affected. 
depending on what the steam conditions were and what the level of correction that you achieved was. So now let's, let's talk about, this is your question before, why is it sharper in the center and blurry in the edges, the, the ionosoplanetism? And the reason is because different field points in your detector uh, come from different angles in the sky. And that means that they travel through different volumes of the, uh, volumes of the atmosphere. So when you're measuring along the red direction, you're measuring a certain amount of distortions along this volume of atmosphere. And when you try to apply these distortions, you could try to correct for them for all field points. Uh, these distortions are not valid for all field points because all different field points will see different distortions. Uh, this plot here just basically highlights the same thing, how the correction. Uh, this here on the, on the left, uh, on the y-axis, is the strail ratio, which is a measure of, of uh, the image quality that you achieve, zero being bad and one being perfect. So uh, the correction that you achieve is good on axis, basically where you're measuring, where your wavefront sensor is measuring, and then it degrades quickly as you get away from that. Now let's talk about the averaging effect that we suffer because uh, we cross-correlate our superaperture images. So each one of those superapertures images a certain field of view of, of the sun, so we can actually do uh, the cross-correlation and detect the shifts. And uh, usually they, they measure the image around 10 R seconds. So every time we calculate the correlations, it's, it's equivalent to averaging the, the distortions uh, along a, a 10 R seconds cone in the atmosphere. So when you have a, a layer low enough, these 10 R second cones, the projection of these 10 R seconds is not big. But when you get to high layers, the projection of your 10 R seconds grows. And you end up averaging over a large area, and you end up washing, up all this, washing out all this detail. And, and you end up not being able to measure these very high layers. So we lose sensitivity to these distortions uh, as we increase the height. Now, any distortions that we, are able to, well, that we are not able to see, we will not be able to correct. And they'll go through your system and correct it and end up in your science image. Uh, the importance of these distortions is, again, proportional to D over R0. So if the R0 of the layer that you don't see and you don't correct and it goes through, it's uh, comparable to the size of your, of your telescope, then everything is good, or, or bigger, then everything is good. And that was the case with previous generation telescopes because the, uh, the R0 values at uh, high altitude are usually a bit larger, but they run around the, the meter range. So for previous generation telescopes, you had an aperture size of one meter, you didn't see very high layers, you didn't care about it. Now, DKS is gonna have four meter aperture. So these effects come into play. And what this translates into is a, a reduction in the correction, in the AO correction that you're gonna see across the field of view, even on axis where, you're, where your correction is highest. And to make things worse, <coughs> when we look early in the morning, we are looking tilted. Uh, so that means that a, a certain height, a certain layer, a certain height is gonna appear as if it was much farther away from us. The 10 field of view cone is gonna be much larger the averaging is gonna be more severe. So we're not gonna, we're gonna uh, be less sensitive to this layer. So here, here I illustrate in this plot how when you look straight up, 90 degrees elevation, you achieve this performance. And when you go down, as you, go, as you keep going down in elevation, your performance drops across the board, on axis and across the field. Now, all these limitations, they will have an effect on your data. Uh, in particular, when you are, uh, when your data comes from, uh, when your data relies on, 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 how to say this? When your data combines different exposures, like for example, uh, if you wanna measure doublet velocities, one way to do it is you take a, a, an exposure on the left side of the line, you take another exposure on the right side of the line, you subtract them and you see how much this line is shifted. So that tells you an idea of the velocities in your image. Now, these two images are taken at different times. They're gonna be affected by different scene conditions and they're gonna be affected by different AO corrections. So you may have artifacts in your velocity measurements that you need to be aware of. Uh, polarimetry also, like uh, Valentin was mentioning, that to, to build these polarimetry maps, you need to take several exposures in, with different modulation parameters. And these exposures are usually taken at different times. So that also may introduce some, some artifacts into your, into your data. And when you're talking about slate instruments where you're scanning across the field to build your image, 
and, and have a, a, a 3D cube with you when you have wavelength and image, all these slit measurements are taken at different times. So this is also will have an effect. Now, uh, the good thing is that AO preserves diffraction limited information, so we can do something to these images because the information is there. It's just not there in the proper way. So we can use several processing techniques, uh, such as speckle reconstruction or deconvolution. Uh, we can, the, the, there's many people that use blind deconvolution when you, where you don't know what your PSF, what your distortions are, and you just try to estimate it. Or you can try to have a, a best guess of your PSF, your corrected PSF, and try to, to improve your image that way. Now, all these post-processing techniques are not magic, and, and some of them may not be uh, valid for some applications. Like, for example, speckle reconstructions uh, rely on very uh, quick uh, on bursts of, of very short exposures. So for some applications, that will not be possible. Um, but in any case, yes, question? Um, is it possible to use deconvolution to recover information beyond the diffraction limit, like to deconvolve the diffraction pattern itself? I mean, there's people that they call that super resolution, right? Uh, in, in this case, I'd say no, because they, they play tricks with it. They, they did their things, so they, they basically shift the pixel halfway this other way. So I'd say no in these applications, astronomical applications. You cannot get anything for free. Uh, so, but the, the DKISTIO system uh, is designed to store all the information required so these post processing techniques can be applied once uh, the data is taken. So now this brings me to, the, to the, the next step. Now, we've seen the limitations of adaptive optics. So now the next step forward is multi-conjugate adaptive optics. And the difference between, uh, well, the main point with multi-conjugate MCAO, multi-conjugate adaptive optics, is that we add more mirrors. And we conjugate these mirrors to different heights in the atmosphere, ideally to where the distortions are coming from. And as you can see here from the, from the diagram, uh, if we correct this, this, uh, uh, the distortions coming from this layer here over a much wider field of view, these distortions are going to affect this field direction and this field direction. So now we're not only correcting for distortions along one direction, we're correcting over a certain field of view. For that, we need several mirrors conjugated at the different layers. And we need to be able to sense where these distortions are coming from. We need to be able to tomographically reconstruct where the distortions in height are coming from the atmosphere. So we need to have several wavefront sensors that are looking different directions so we can reconstruct the, the 3D structure of the atmosphere. Now, these are significantly more complex systems than the regular AO. Uh, so the DKIST MCO system that we're designing right now is not going to be a first light instrument, but will be an upgrade in the future. Uh, we'll have nine wavefront sensors as opposed to one. Each one looking uh, in, a, in a certain 3x3 three three grid uh, covering uh, around 60 R seconds. So with that, we attempt to, to correct the, the field of view over a field of view of 60 R seconds. And it will have three DMs conjugated at different heights. Uh, and then when you start running the numbers, uh, each one of these nine wavefront sensors will have 13, 15 subapertures. So multiply that by nine and then multiply by two because we get X and Y shift from each aperture, and you end up with 23,000 shifts. So we need to calculate over, well, almost 12,000 cross correlations in less than half a millisecond and build this uh, 23,000 vector shift. And then we gotta multiply by this matrix that will reconstruct our, the, the shape of our DMs so we can uh, close the loop and provide the correction. So all these operations need to have is need to happen really fast, and there are a lot of operations. And just storing this, I mean, this is several, I don't know how many gigabytes this is. So this has to happen in that millisecond? Like half a millisecond, less than half a millisecond. Yes? Uh, what do you mean by conjugated different heights? Well, conjugated in the optical sense. So in the optical sense, when you conjugate a plane to another plane, they're said to be equivalent. So for example, uh, a simple example, the sun is conjugated to your, to, your, to your focal point of your camera, your telescope. So these two planes are conjugated to each other. They're equivalent. What you see in the sun is the same as what you see in that, in that plane. Now, if you start moving that plane away, you bring it from the sun. 
and then you bring it into the atmosphere and you find the height that you want and that's where you put your deformable mirror. So does MCAO work? Here on the left, uh, we have the AO corrected video that I've been playing until now. And you can see this is sharp in the center and it degrades as you get away. And here on the right is the multi-conjugate uh, adaptive optics correction. Now, you, you, sti you still can see a certain uh, amount of distortion and, and something going on. But certainly the, the correct field of view, and you can look at some area here, like for example, this little guy there, this little bright point there, it's completely gone here. But we were able to recover it. So now the correction that we are able to provide is, is valid over a much wider field of view. And these, are, again, these are simulations, right? We still don't have the systems, we still don't have the telescope, but we do have one MCO, a real MCO system in Big Bear. Uh, it's called CLEAR. Uh, the Big Bear Solar Observatory. And right now here in the video, right now it's operating in classical adaptive optics mode. So, oh, and now it went to MCAO. So it, the video will loop, you can see it again. But you can see here the, the correction is much, is, 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 uh, is much valid over a much wider field of view area. And now the, the regular AO is sharp in the, in the center and then the correction degrades rapidly when you get away from it. And it'll switch again to MCAO. Boom. So this one is only correcting a 35 per second field of view. The, the full uh, size of this image is uh, 53 by 53. So the MCO system will be a much more complex system than this one. But this one is also for a smaller telescope, just 1.6 meters. But we do have a, an operating system. So this is happening. It's not science fiction anymore. Right, and with that, I will, I will end. And if you have any questions. So you say that there's a little bit of a jitter in the, in the, yeah. So, I mean, nothing is perfect. And this is one of the, the this is the first MCO system operating right now. The only MCO system operating in the world. And, and you should see, uh, if you look beyond the 35 per seconds, then we are not correcting for that. But there, there is always something, uh, like, like with AO, the correction is not perfect. With MCAO, the correction is not going to be perfect. And the reason is, uh, you have a 3D volume of atmosphere, and you put uh, 2DMs. In this case, it's 2DMs conjugated to certain heights and one conjugated to the pupil. So you are sampling the atmosphere with two layers. And there's uh, distortions coming from all over the place. So you're still going to be, there's going to be things there that you are not correcting for. But it is a significant step up from regular AO. And if you store the, the telemetry, you in principle could be capable of, of uh, post-processing this and, and get more out of it. Yes? How do we do all those calculations in such a process? Uh, how do we do the calculations that the AO needs to do in such a short time? We parallelize heavily. So the, the previous generations AO, solar AO, they relied on DSPs and, and, and uh, what, how do you call the other ones? Well, DSPs are data ah, signal processing. So they're basically dedicated processes that just do math really fast. They don't do anything else, just math. FPGAs. FPGAs. That's, that, so that's something else that you can do. It's the same idea. They just do this operation, and they, oh, that's the only thing they do, and they do it really fast. But computers are getting so fast nowadays that we can actually use off-the-shelf Intel processors to do these things. We just need to, to get a, a computer with many cores and parallelize the computation. Yes? But can you say anything about wavelength dependence of these corrections? So uh, the the wavelength dependent uh, the wavelength sensor measures the shape of the wavelength, and this is wavelength 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 independent. So whatever correction you apply with your mirror, which is also wavelength independent, will be valid across all wavelengths. And when you go to higher wavelengths, uh, the R zero also grows and the importance of these distortions goes down. So when you go to high wavelengths, uh, 
large, uh, yeah, large wavelengths, the distortions that the atmosphere introduces are less severe. So you, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, these, these corrections are wavelength independent, right? They're valid for all. The only, the only catch comes when you're looking low in the atmosphere and you have an atmospheric dispersion. Then you may get into trouble because now your wavelengths are separating. And you, and you combine, uh, well, you run into the anisoplanetism problem where you are measuring here and correcting there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, measuring here, correcting there, but actually observing there. Sure. Well, I guess I'm assuming that the wavelength, the, the refractive, refractive index does not change much with wavelength. But then that would contribute, I think, what you said about seeing something on the horizon. That's true. It's, well, so I'm not sure I understand it. Yeah. In fact, I'm sure I don't understand it. <laughs> There is a small chromaticity within the effect of image of the there is a little bit of But yet that's not the system itself that's Did you say that? Yeah. And I mean, I see it from the, from the examples. Like, if you go to the previous one, not the little I mean, the, if, if I show you this, if I use this to argue my point. Um, yeah, the, the, the slide before the one, and that's one. No, that was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my argument is that the frequencies are there; they're just damped down. So the information is there, but it's, so, and that this is what I, what I argue with this plot here: the informations are restored, but they're not where they should be. So the image looks not as good. So it drops to zero where it should drop to zero, but it's sort of scaled down for all the. High right. Okay. So you're still going to have some mix in there. Yes. Uh, well, the, the calculation is, you know, I normalized to this. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a diffraction limited. So I, I get uh, the original object, which is a much higher resolution, and I convolve it with the, with the LTF of a four meter telescope. Yes? Well, the, the only amount of light you will lose is the number of extra reflections you have. So, because you have more mirrors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we will have to take. Uh, so, this is something we're working on right now because uh, each one of these uh, wavefront sensors would be looking at a different area of the sun. They're looking in different directions. So in theory, we shouldn't have to lose any light. We use the same light as before, because each wavefront sensor is looking to a different area. They don't have to share that light. Now, this is turning tricky to do. It's turning to be a bit tricky, so we don't know yet. I mean, another way to do it would be to split the light nine ways, and then each one gets whatever it needs. 
But the, the optimal way of doing it would be to split only the region you're interested in and send that to all the nine wavefront sensors. So in theory, you wouldn't lose any, any extra light. Yeah, I guess I don't have an answer to that now. I'll have to think about it. Right, that's what I'm thinking is the frequency of the, fr of the phase distortions, right. which may not translate one to one to spatial frequency in the image. But I, 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 I don't feel comfortable telling you things now. <laughs> I have to think about it. So the question is, how long can you run the AO system? Can you run it forever when you're observing? Uh, in principle, yes, if the scene behaves. Because it gets to a point, and you, you'll, you'll have experience with the system in, in Sunspot. If the scene gets really, really bad, there's just nothing you can do. But if the system is stable, there is, in theory, nothing that will make you stop the, the AO system. And that's an important thing. Yeah. And the, Thought has been put into, into the fact that they want the system to be reliable and to be operational at all times. So they, they expect the system to operate and handle scene variations and come back, and then handle more scene variations and stay constant and stay on. Now, the, the correction that you receive, that you provide, may, may change, may vary. When the scene is good, you get really good correction. When the scene is not so good, you may get not so good correction. But the plan is that the system will stay on and continue at it. Um, you can see it in the, in the picture here, in the video that I showed from the actual real MCO system. I mean, you can see sometimes it, it wants to lose the, the, the correction. It just it gets very blurry, but it sticks to it, it stays on. The right, well, actually, I don't know. There has to be a mirror somewhere that, that will scan, but yeah. do you know, Ali? Who is, how do you scan the, the slit in the spectrograph? Oh, the slit moves. The slit itself moves. It's an instrumental but it's Right. Well, he was wondering maybe the, the AO would introduce tilt and shift the image on the slit of the, of the instrument. But no, the, the, the slit itself moves. Uh, so, so the, the question is, in, many, in some telescopes, when the AO crashes, the, the scene gets bad, I assume, uh, the operator has to manually restart it and get a new reference. And so to a certain extent, uh, so the, the AO system at DKS will be is designed so it will try as much as possible to stay on by itself without any, any help. But if the system loses it for some, whatever reason, the operator can, uh, from the control room, restart, take a new reference, or operate the system. The, the operator does not need to go into the, the optical room to do this. <coughs> 